Hi, everyone. From the American College of Cardiology, this is Dharam Kumbani from UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. I'm the clinical trials lead for ACC.org. Today, we'll be covering the Wednesday, October 25th trials from this year's TCT meeting in San Francisco. We've picked three landmark practice-changing trials to talk to you about today. I'm so delighted to be joined by two clinical trial experts, Dr. Key Park from the University of Florida in Gainesville and Dr. Ajay Kirtane from Columbia University in New York, who is also one of the core program directors for this amazing meeting. Welcome to both of you and thank you for joining us today. So we'll, yeah, we'll start with the with the agent trial. Um, so he, this appears to be the first drug-coated balloon trial in the U.S. Tell us about this. Yeah, so uh, of course at TCT every year, there's many amazing studies, but um, I'm really excited to see this because we've all heard sort of the um, hoopla about DCPs in Europe, and um, this is really um, very, very exciting. Um, so this was a multicenter study looking at the agent paxlitaxel coated balloon. Um, we know ISR is a problem. We all see it in our practices. And so the opportunity to really look at this in this really challenging population is very exciting. So this is a two-to-one randomization study at 40 sites across uh, the United States, specifically certain populations such as STEMI, left mean, vein grafts, um, lesions with thrombus, and then more specifically excluded. Um, 400 patients were um, eligible for randomization, again, in a two-to-one fashion. Interestingly, uh, I think this is very notable, is that about half of the patients uh, had single stent layers and about the other half um, had multiple stent layers. Um, and perhaps Dr. Kirtan can comment on this, but I believe this actually um, accelerated the enrollment um, of the, the study. Um, and so that speaks to the challenge with these patients. Um, the lesions were generally distributed evenly over the three major epicardial vessels, again, excluding the left main. Um, technical success was high. Um, notably, again, I think this is wonderful. Intravascular imaging use was also very significant and about 70% for both groups. So the primary endpoint of TLF was um, significantly met at one year with the agent DCP balloon. The components of TLR and target vessel MI were also significant. And notably, there was no case of stent thrombosis at one year, speaking to the safety of this um, device. So overall, I think um, it did meet the clinical endpoint um, and really is promising in terms of coming to the United States and offering us a, a different option for these challenging resinosis patients. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Ajay, you were the senior um, author on this paper. Um, love to get your thoughts on this. No, I, I think the summary was fantastic. And that issue of the multi-layer stent um, is one that uh, confronts a lot of us. And certainly in the United States, we don't have these devices. So this was a trial designed to get one of these devices approved in the United States. Um, I think our European colleagues will certainly gripe at the choice of the control group, not including a drug eluting stent. Um, but that was one of the rationales is that 50% of the patients actually had multi-layer where they were patients with brachytherapy, failures, et cetera. And so um, you know, our hope is, is that this will lead to approval of this device in the United States, setting the stage for other devices as well. And so for, uh, we can finally catch up with our European colleague in this regard. Yeah, thank you. That will be amazing. I think we all recognize that as uh, an important gap in our armamentarium with these patients. Um, so yeah, thank you both for your perspectives. Um, next, I'll discuss the TPAS trial from South Korea. Um, so we thought this was an important trial. They had close to 3,000 patients with ACS who all in, uh, underwent implantation of a bioresorbable bio polymer serolimus eluting stent, sorry, that's a mouthful, the OSIRO stent, um, as we commonly know it, who were randomized to receive either um, less than one month of DAP with aspirin and ticagalor, the median being 16 days, followed by ticagalor monotherapy compared with 12 months of um, traditional DAP with aspirin and ticagalor. And you know what was really interesting to me is um, nearly 40% of the patients uh, that were included actually presented with a STEMI. The primary endpoint, which was a composite of ischemic, ischemic and bleeding endpoints, was uh, met the criteria for non-inferiority of the abbreviated DAP regimen compared with the standard DAP regimen. Uh, and not surprisingly, I suppose this was primarily driven by a reduction in bleeding events, although it was really um, reassured to see that the MACE events were similar and the incidence of stent thrombosis at one year was 0.1%. So I think this is really uh, potentially could be practice changing. It does extend the findings of the Twilight and the TICO um, trials, which have been done in the you know a similar patient population. Although Twilight did not include STEMI patients, 
uh, and those trials only included three months or they um, included three months of DAP rather than sort of the 16 day um, you know DAP that we saw in this trial. Now, what's what's really interesting to me is I think there are three broad aspects or domains here when we're choosing um, sort of between between these different strategies. So one is the type of stent, one is which antiplatelet agent you're going to drop, uh, and the other is the bleeding profile. Now, this trial specifically excluded patients who are high bleeding risk. For example, those who needed um, concomitant oral anticoagulation. Ajay, you helped run the Onyx One trial, and more recently we saw the BioFlowDAP trial at ESC. Love to get your thoughts on this trial as well. Well, I think first is this, uh, the investigators should be congratulated. This is one of the highest rated trials among the trials submitted to the TCT. And um, this issue of discontinuation is really important because we know that we can reduce bleeding complications. But enrolling an ACS population with 40% STEMI, exactly as you pointed out, Dharam, is really important because there are trials with clopidogrel demonstrating that if you stop too early, you actually can increase your ischemic events. The advantage of an agent um, like a potent P2Y12 inhibitor like Ticagavor is that you likely don't have the variability you have with clopidogrel, and so therefore it might be safer to drop aspirin. Um, I do believe that's what uh, th that's what many people will take home from this trial. Now, notably, it's not fully powered for some of these endpoints, particularly the ischemic endpoints, so we have to be a little cautious. But overall, almost 3,000 patients enrolled. It's pretty uh, imp impressive data. Well, thank you. Um... And then maybe I'm going to come back to you with another sort of really interesting um, aspect um, of uh, PCI and the cath lab, the use of physiologic testing. So um, we have the presentation from the Swedish National Registry, the Sweetheart Registry, uh, and that compared ISR to FSR. Ajay, tell us why this is important. Well, first, I think it's good to see coronary studies because there's so much structural heart disease like day one of TCT, and now you're starting to see a nice uh, number of, of good uh, coronary studies. And this is a controversy that came up uh, starting at, at EuroPCR and then really kind of exploded a little bit at ESC um, based upon prior randomized trial, defined flare in particular, and then even combining that with the Sweetheart randomized trial of IFR versus FFR for physiologic guidance. The controversy was that there was an increased rate of mortality seen among patients that are randomly assigned to IFR. Interestingly, though, the increase in mortality was confined to those patients that got revascularized. So when many people think of why somebody would have an increased rate of mortality, it's typically going to be because you're leaving things behind that ought to be treated and those things can cause problems. That was not seen in those studies. Nonetheless, um, what these investigators sought to do is to take a large registry database in Sweden where they can get a basically 100% capture of follow-up events and analyze these patients um, and their data to determine is there a hazard associated with the use of IFR. Um, this is what large registry data is probably best at doing, um, identifying these types of safety signals. And over 42,000 patients, uh, what was done is an analysis of adverse outcomes, MACE, and then specifically mortality based on IFR use or FFR use. The, the bottom line of this is after adjustment, there were really, really equivalent outcomes seen uh, across the board. Um, and I think this should give clinicians a lot of reassurance when they're using non-hyperemic tests um, to determine whether patients ought to be treated or not. There's certainly not a lot of downside to giving adenosine if you need to, but on the basis of these data, I think we can probably peel back some of the concern that it was engendered after the ESC meeting. Thank you. That was such a great summary. Um, I really, uh, I'm sure this is not the last of um, you know this kind of analysis, and I'm sure we'll we'll be hearing more about this, but definitely very reassuring. So. Um, Again, uh, thank you uh, both for sharing your insights on today's important trials at TCT in San Francisco. This is Dharam Kumbani for the ACC.org. Thank you so much for joining us.